Nurani sisters and Indian Ocean, either online on Book My Show or at their tent outside Digi Palace or at the venue, Clark Samay. And now for translations and equal music, please help me welcome Arnava Sinha, Daniel Han, Manjushri Thapa, Pushpesh Panth, who are in conversation with the moderator for the session, Anupama Raju. This session is specially brought to you by Dainik Baskar. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Thank you for being here and uh, showing your interest in translations. So our uh, discussion today is called Translations and Equal Music. But uh, I'd like to borrow a metaphor from uh, maybe painting or even cooking, uh, because in fact, we were just talking about food. So translating is, is like recreating a recipe. Um, except using different ingredients. Um, what happens to that dish? Does it still taste the same? Um, what are the new flavors that you experience when you're trying to make a chutney, say, out of um, rosemary or thyme instead of pudina? Um, it's like painting, except that you're recreating a classic using maybe watercolors instead of oils. But today, uh, I'm really eager to be uh, talking to a very distinguished panel of translators um, on the process of translation and what they find uh, inspiring and frustrating about the whole process. So uh, let me begin by introducing the panel. Manjushri. Manjushri Thapa is the author of 10 books of fiction Nonfiction and literary translation. Her latest novel is All of Us in Our Own Lives, set in the cynical, moneyed world of international aid in Nepal. She has recently translated Indra Bahadur Rai's classic Darjeeling novel, There's a Carnival Today, into English. Arunava Sinha translates classic, modern, and contemporary Bengali fiction and nonfiction into English and English fiction into Bengali. 49 of his translations have been published so far in India and 10 in the US and UK. Twice the winner of the Crossword Translation Award for Shankar's Choringi and Anita Agnihotri 17, he has also won the Muse India Award for translation for When the Time is Right and been shortlisted for the Independent Foreign Fiction Prize for his translation of Choringi. Daniel Han is a writer, editor, and translator with some 60 books to his name. You have to explain how you managed that. <laughs> Recent work has won him the International Dublin Literary Award and been shortlisted for the Man Booker International Prize, among others. He's a past chair of the Society of Authors, the UK Writers' Union. Pushpesh Pant is a part-time teacher part-time author, TV anchor, and independent producer of documentaries. Obsessed by food for the last few decades, he has been trying to rediscover lost culinary gems from India's vast and varied repertoire. Pant doesn't believe in prohibition of prescriptions when it comes to dietary matters. <laughs> Looking forward to listening to all your views on translation. Now, this question is for all of you, and I would really like you to answer today's questions in the context of your respective translations. 
we will also see if we can fit in a few readings every now and then to substantiate what you're saying, because I'm sure we would love to listen to specific examples where appropriate. But I leave it to you, and we'll see how the conversation goes. Uh, first and foremost, what motivates you to translate? Um, would you like to begin, Manjushri? Sure. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I think uh, before I translated, I was a writer, writing my own work. And even before that, I was a reader. So the very first uh, translations that I read that really made me want to translate were uh, Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak's translations of Mahaswata Devi's work, which are absolutely beautiful. Um, and that was what made me feel like I could try and translate some Nepali literature into English, because I write in English. Um, and so for me, what really motivated the pieces that I began with, which were stories and poems, shorter pieces, um, and now I've, I've translated a novel, um, is love. And Spivak also talks about uh, translation as an act of love. So it's an engagement with the text that is deeper than just reading it. It is really a, a sort of uh, deep relationship with the text that changes the text and changes you and changes uh, the author's body of work. So uh, for me, the answer really is love. If I love a, a book, then I want to translate it. Yes, um, push page. Uh, I feel quite like an interloper here, you know, because I think you are all accomplished translators, award-winning translators, and here I am with the one translation to my credit uh, published, a very small, thin volume, Moyan, and then one which brings me here is Namita's uh, Things to Leave Behind translated um, by me, I don't know how satisfactorily, as Raak Pahadi. And that answers your question, because when I was reading that book, it, I had absolutely no choice. Mm. I almost were wishing that, I wish I had written this book. And I wanted it to be accessible to as many people uh, in as many places, but particularly in Uttarakhand, where this book was focused on. And it raised the issues of uh, the caste, the high caste Brahmins versus the untouchables, conversions, very relevant to present times, into Christianity, modernity, tradition, those tensions. And it evoked uh, the Uttarakhand of my childhood, the Himalayan villages, so powerfully that and I had been working on a non-fiction uh, book on Almora, which partly overlaps with this, but what Namita had done was sheer magic. She was blurring the lines between myth and reality, fantasy and fiction, uh, history and legend and lore, and autobiography, and also uh, narrating in an oral tradition. So the book was so fascinating, and I couldn't possibly help say that, uh, I couldn't have written it, she had already written it, and done it brilliantly, but maybe I could try my hand at translating, and make the book partly my own. Um, I no longer remember what motivated <laughs> me to begin with, right. but all I know now is that that's who I am, and I'd lose my identity, I think, if I weren't translating. And um, it's perhaps the most immersive form of writing that there can be. And a famous writer once described it as uh, part poetry, part crossword puzzle. Right. So it brings just the right combination of both halves of your brain into it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, I can't stop. I don't think I'll ever... <laughs> Don't. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, Daniel. Um, I, I, there are two reasons I translate, and one of them I think is, is very close to what you have all been describing, um, which is um, I, I discover a book or I am shown a book and I love this book and I want other people to be able to read it. Um, the most recent thing I published was a Brazilian novel which I read in Portuguese. I thought this is amazing. I want everyone to be able to oh, no, wait, they can't, it's in the wrong language. Mm. And what I really want is to give that experience that I have of reading a book or of discovering a writer to, to other people. So it is motivated by the love of the book and it's motivated by, um, as you say, wanting people to be able to have this experience and to read this book. Um, I also have a, a, a different reason for translating, which is, of course, a much more uh, vulgar reason, which is this is also my job and this is how I make a living. Right. Um, and so I don't quite translate for the money, but I also do that sometimes. And I think it's quite interesting when we're talking about translation, it's, we talk so much about it as a, as a very, as sort of a noble thing and so much about the artistry and so much about wanting to share these things of, of huge value. 
But especially, I think, in a culture like mine in the UK, where we're beginning to translate much more widely and beginning to translate things which might be quite commercial, things which might not have, you know, which may not be read throughout the ages, but are, are, are relatively kind of you know, transitory things. Um, I think it's also important that those of us who translate feel comfortable doing this as a way of making a living. I sometimes often translate because I find a book and I'm passionate about it, but I also translate uh, in order to pay my rent. Um, and I, and I, I feel slightly apologetic saying that, but I think, I think, this is, I think it's important. I, also, because this came up in conversation yesterday as part, of, um, as part of JBM, as part of the Bookmark program, the idea that translators, and this varies hugely from country to country, the extent to which translators are in fact paid adequately, that they can do this, they can devote their time to it, they can spend enough time to make something good, and that depends on on very vulgar things like is there enough money in the in the process, and actually for me because this is my principal way of earning a living, um, it's actually quite important to me that that I uh, that I'm driven by by you know strong passionate artistic evangelical feelings about about my writers, um, but there is another but there's another kind of imperative as well. Right, so um, I open that question up to the others as well. Is it really possible and practical to make a living as a translator in India? <laughs> the, the, do you want the long answer or the short answer? <laughs> as you like. But they're identical, no. Right. <laughs> Not as a translator, no. And it's, 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 I mean, it's, you know, if you look at the impact that um, translators have had on people's reading, we, most Indians read Manto or Ismat Chuktai or Prem Chand or um, Tagore or um, a number of other writers from other languages in translation. Mm. But translators almost, not almost, never uh, um, get the kind of compensation mm. that, that would allow them to devote more of their time and effort to this. So no, you have to have a day job or you have to, well yeah, you have to have a day job because you usually translate at night. <laughs> Right. Yes, please. I just, uh, you know, so for me, because I translate from Nepali into English, and I think it's also related to the economy attached to the language. So the Nepali language is a fairly powerless language in terms of the publishing industry behind it, in term, just in terms of sheer power as a nation or as, as a people, the Nepali-speaking people. But outside of that, the publishing world is very... Uh, 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 has you know very little resources to spend, and certainly especially on translation. So we've got a situation where you know it's a language that's got about 24 million native speakers. It's surrounded by Hindi, which has something like 300 million uh, native speakers, and then or Urdu, which is just as large, or Bengali, which is just as large and boisterous, and also ha are more powerful in their areas. So um, for me as a translator. Um, and I know this is true in Nepal in general. Uh, there's absolutely nobody making a living out of translation. Um, it's purely a labor of love. And I know I've, I've spoken to Aruna over email many times trying to figure out how to afford to translate because I do want, I, you know, I, there is so much work that merits translation. And again, I feel like the readers, uh, I want to share that experience with readers to show it. You know, this last novel I translated is from Darjeeling, which is one of the least powerful places in India. And uh, it's, uh, Indra Badr Rai is a Saitya Academy winning author. So he's recognized at the national level in India, but nobody has read him because he hasn't been translated. Um, so I want to be able to share his work to Indian readers, uh, but just affording it is, so it is purely a labor of love at this point. Right. Um, so talking of labor of love and... But sorry, can I just add something? Sure. Sorry, unless you have... Yeah. No, uh, there is one way, however, in which Indian translators can get well compensated for a book, which is if you are published abroad. Hmm. Because then you get, you, you get international fees, and that works out well. Uh, so it's good for that book. The trouble right. is you still can't do that consistently and make your living from it yes. year after year. Yes. Um, so talking of the labor of love... Um, often the language you're translating from, uh, I mean, that is, that is a language that you hold yourself obviously close to. It is, it is often your mother tongue. 
Um, in your case, uh, Daniel, you, you translate from Portuguese, Spanish, French. So how, uh, of course, I would like to hear from each of you on this. How does translation change or affect your relationship with, with that particular language? In your case, there are multiple. It's a really interesting question because I, I have uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and French are the languages I translate from. Um, and I have quite different relationships to all of those languages. What they have in common is, um, is my lack of competence in them. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a very comfortable reader in all of those languages. I'm a very comfortable listener, eavesdropper in those languages. Um, I don't have any confidence in producing them. I'm very, very bad speaking them. I make mistakes. My accent is terrible. I cannot write in them. It's slightly humiliating. But my language is, my, my kind of passive language, my receptive language is very, is very good in all of those. And to some extent, that's come from the various ways in which I got them. I have Portuguese and Spanish because my mother is from Brazil and my father from Argentina. We only, I've only ever spoken English to my parents, but the languages have been sort of around quite a lot. My French, I learned at school, I learned at secondary school, I did an A-level when I was 18, um, and the only reason it's still functioning now is because I haven't stopped reading in those languages. But in all of those cases, the fact that I've been reading and working in those languages has improved my sensitivity to the language, they've improved my um, the breadth of my vocabulary, the breadth of my sense of voice, my, my kind of aesthetic sense and understanding these languages. Um, but to this day, I, f I struggle to, to produce them with anything f that feels like even basic competence. And it's slightly embarrassing, I think, because people assume that, and it's, it's certainly true in a country like India where so many people are so comfortable in more than one language, but the idea that it's possible to be a translator, I think people will automatically assume, well, that means you must be fluent in right. Portuguese or Spanish and French. And then I open my mouth and try and order a cup of coffee, and it's, it's a profoundly humiliating thing. <laughs> it's, I, I get away with it. It's amazing what I can get away with, though. <laughs> push, push. You know, I'm tempted to add to what uh, Daniel said. I think uh, there's a difference between uh, translating from one major European language, like French, Portuguese, Spanish, into English. And the comparison is very different what Manjushi was talking a little while ago about Nepalese being surrounded by this 300 million people speaking Hindi. Uh, but the interesting part is this, that if you are in India, uh, this Hindi which is gigantic and seems to threaten everybody, the younger sisters and so on. And I come from an area in the Hindi heartland, not quite the Hindi heartland, but the periphery, which is divided, separated from Nepal by Mahakali River. That side is Doti Beltadi and this side is my village. So Nepali for me is not an alien dialect or a language. It is part of my growing up as a child in the Himalayan hinterland. I was fortunate to have a mother who was a polyglot. She could speak fluently Gujarati, Marathi, Kannada, Samia, Odia. Besides, she was trained in Sanskrit, Pali, Prakrit, and Tibetan. Uh, but the point is, she was a very anti-translation person. When we were growing up at home, she would say, oh, why do you have to read a translation? Read Giju Bhai Ni Chopodi on Gujarati, read Popat Kartu Nati, Popat Sotu Nati, Popat Amal Bani Dar. And she would say, oh, why do you have to read Pratani Prabhuta? Read it in Gujarati. And she raised me up in Abol Tabol in Bengali, and I have the same problem. I can be a passive but a fairly uh, effective uh, intruder, eavesdropper in five Indian languages and I have suffered much greater humiliation than him when I tried to speak in Tamil in uh, Tamil Nadu, say, Iri Peri Peri So I had, uh, uh, you, you of course understand what that is. And I was talking to you in the minibus in the morning. I enjoyed reading Muhammad Bakum Bashir in translation in Hindi. So I think there's a very great difference between uh, you are feeling comfortable in the language in which you can play with the words, you think you know the language, and then you suddenly realize when you are translating, like it happened to me, uh, my greatest humiliation translating Namita's book very recently, I didn't know the right Hindi words to get the tone and the uh, idiom right. The interesting, uh, it will just take a minute, uh, sure, maybe no, less. No, uh, this was about uh, a Christian missionary woman, uh, a victim of the mutiny, uh, taking refuge in the hills. And there is a line which says, I, I, it's a slave from the Old Testament, I shall raise my eyes to the mountain where from the, hill, uh, the hell help comes. Or there's a sentence like that, I walk in the valley of shadow of death, but I'm not afraid, etc. 
Now, these are references which make sense, we have, which have great evocative power, because they are languages from the translation of King James Version of Old Testament. Now, you try to get them in contemporary Hindi, they sound stilted, they don't make sense. Or there would be, mm, there would be evocative things which in English which would say, uh, you could feel that he was getting hard. And the moment you translate into colloquial Hindi, it's almost like vulgar abuse. So you can't do that. You realize that you thought you knew Hindi very well, but, uh, the, and you thought you did English very well, and I belong to a generation where translations were forced upon us. 30 marks in class matriculation examination were given to English to Hindi translation, never from Hindi to English translation. So this process of doing reverse translations from what you know your mother tongue to your second or the first language or the other way around is a challenge. Now, what you do is, I think, the most difficult job when you are translating poetry. I mean, how do you translate poetry? And you know, uh, and how do you, you know, you also have something like uh, symphonic music in the Western classical system, which is composed by a great composer, but a conductor can have printed score and play it creatively different, improvising every time he plays. Can a translator do that? And there is that long essay by Vladimir Nobokov on translation of Ivan Onjin, whether a poetic translation is right or a literal translation is right. So that is the kind of thing which bothers me very greatly. But don't we translate all the time when we need something? Now, there is this young man, Utkarsh Tiwari, sitting in the second row. He had a book in his hand called uh, How to Kill a Mockingbird. And that is a book which I had read for the first time at about the same age when I was there, almost six decades back. And I did not know English well enough then. So I would be translating a word, go to a dictionary. Maybe the word would make sense. Was it an English Hindi dictionary? Was it an English English thesaurus? So I think this mysterious way the language works on you and the words change meaning with association is something which uh, fascinates me. Sure. What about uh, Bengali? And uh, how has that changed your relationship with your language? Yeah, well, I think, you know, nobody reads a book closer than a translator, mm. not even the author. Right. So you certainly discover what a language is capable of when you're translating it. Mm. And um, it's, uh, it, it just, it, it, it frightens you because you realize there's so much going on in that original language and you're quite unsure whether you can capture all of that or take all of that across, whether you know your English well enough to be able to do all of that. So the primary feeling is dread, awe, and, and tremendous nervousness. Right, right. Uh, Manushri, in your case, I also want to uh, bring in the uh, question of dialects. Uh, now, Nepali also, I'm sure, like many other languages, you know, has its share of dialects. How have you encountered uh, this when you translate from Nepali? Uh, you know, so ne Nepali, like any lingua franca, is very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, it's spoken maybe by about three million people in India, and few, fewer in Bhutan. We don't know how many people in Bhutan, but uh, the rest, about uh, 21, 20 million in, in Nepal. And there's a huge variation from the east to the west. So when I was translating Indra Badur Rai's novel, it's written in Darjeeling Nepali, which is not the Nepali of the Kathmandu Valley that I grew up in. Um, and so for me, I had to really make an effort. I was really lucky because uh, Speaking Tigers um, editor that I worked with, Anurag Basnath, is from Darjeeling. Oh. And so <laughs> I, um, I actually did uh, something which is a little naughty where I had him written into my contract saying, if he is the editor, I will translate this <laughs> okay. novel. Um, and he, he and I and other friends in Kathmandu who have a Darjeeling connection we uh, really had to look up the words because Darjeeling Nepali is mixed in with Bengali, uh, with a little bit of Hindi, um, and with English, and it's a very particular kind of uh, uh, dialect of Nepali. Uh, so that, that was a lot of fun uh, for me to figure out, but it was also, um, f you know, it's, so I'm primarily a writer who translates, unlike, let's say, Daniel or, or Arunav, who are primarily translators. Uh, and so for me as a writer, it just becomes a huge advantage. And I actually began to translate as a selfish act because I realized that the writing that was coming out of Nepal in Nepali and Nepal's other 121 languages, 22 languages, um, is much better than the English writing that's coming out of there, including my own. So I wanted to see what my peers were doing. I wanted to read them. And once I read them, I found them so good. And it really has helped my own writing. So one of the uh, main pieces of advice I give to any 
writer who's starting out in this part of the world or in any anyone who's bilingual is to translate because it just it affects your sensibility as a writer if you're also translating. You know, um, there is an essay by Jessica Moore, um, Translation is an Art. And uh, she says that translation is a deeply creative act, yet there is one major difference. Translators never have to stare at an empty page because the canvas is already drawn. Um, now, do you think this is an advantage or a disadvantage? A huge advantage. It's, it's as Arunav said, it, it's like a mixture of poetry and uh, crossword puzzles, you said. And so it's a beautiful, wonderful, playful, exciting, challenging art form that never leaves you with existential questions such as why am I writing this? <laughs> and is this really the story I want to be writing when I could be writing anything else? Uh, so for me, the difference between writing and translating is that translating is pure joy and writing is, uh, there's a lot of agony mixed in with the joy. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I mean, there's no writer's block, for example. The worst that can happen is that you're struggling with one particular passage, so you mm -hmm. just move on to another one and come back to it later. Okay, you make it sound so easy. <laughs> uh, if, I, if I may interrupt. Sure. Uh, I think we are talking largely of literary translations. I think we come to our translator's block. Immediately we come into the domain, step into the domain of technical translations. Mm. So after I retired from JNU um, to keep my hand in, I started teaching in a private university and law. And that is where I got into trouble. There was an act of law, which was in English, which was defining vulgarity and obscenity. And the way the law, the act defined it was something like lasciviousness, prurience. Now, the moment you try to translate something like prurience for my students in a law class, which were not familiar with the English lexicon very well, you could not say khujli. I mean, although the root would be the same. Jo khujli paida kare, it can't be, it can't be. And how do you translate lascivious? How do you say explicit sex? So what we're discussing in a law class was the banning of a film like Bandit Queen, which showed frontal nudity, but Supreme Court in its good wisdom and for good reason had not treated it as vulgar. But the students had problems with M.F. Hussain's paintings of Hindu gods and goddesses depicted in nude. So it basically came down to the issue of prurience and lasciviousness. And that had to be translated. And I think what uh, Arunav said, I think the translators who make most money are technical translators in the Maruti Karkhana about the technical manual into Japanese or into Korean in Hyundai, <laughs> or the translators in reverse from Chinese or Indian to Chinese. So where the languages are, or the Saudis, for the way, I mean, of course, Quran Sharif can't be translated into any other language. It would cease to be a holy book. But the Saudis do spend a lot of time into rendering uh, Quran Sharif accessible to audiences in different languages. So there is money in translation, but not necessarily maybe in literary translations. Sure. Yes. I, I, I mean, I, I, I mostly agree. I'm sort of changing my mind even as I think about it. I mostly agree, but I think that, um, of course, there isn't that kind of existential anxiety about, you know, what is this book supposed to be? I don't know why this book, I don't know what's going to happen, I don't understand, I hate all of the characters. There is none of that. Um, or if there is, it's someone else's problem. You can still hate the characters, but it's, it's someone else's problem. But there is that thing about, um, that thing which Aranava mentioned earlier about reading something and being so aware of how much there is and am I going to be able to preserve those things? And so what you do have instead of that absolutely blank page is that anxiety about being able to deliver something which is good enough to be uh, worthy of the thing that you've started with. It feels in a way like it's almost worse than having a blank page because you have a blank page with somebody else's name at the top. Um, and that is much more worrying in some right. senses. If you think, especially because I'm very fortunate because I translate European languages into English, which means that I'm very lucky with the writers I translate. I'm very lucky that my writers, that, that for them the English translation is important because of the, the, the obvious dominance of English. Um, but it does mean that the responsibility to the reputation of my writers, to the, 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 the way in which my writers are valued around the world, depends on me not making a total disaster of this translation. Um, and so on the one hand, yes, it's very, very helpful and very reassuring to have this other thing that you can hang on to and think, I don't have to worry about the plot. I don't have to worry about the structure. Someone else has already figured out where we're going and what happens at the end. But there is this extra thing, which is I'm now not just 
I can't just do this thing which succeeds or fails and that's my own problem because there is a particular responsibility I have to, to write this masterpiece. Uh, now, it's someone else's masterpiece. I could never write my own masterpiece. But at the same time, the weight of, of, of responsibility, I think, that comes with this thing which, you know, in theory, it may not be a blank page, but it is. I start with a computer screen, I open a Word document, and there is nothing on it. Mm. And I have this little voice of the author telling me what's supposed to happen and what it's supposed to sound like and what the rhythm is supposed to be. Because, again, there is so much that you're trying to keep. You said at the beginning, one of the analogies you used was, you know, you're cooking a recipe using different ingredients, and will it taste the same? But you also have to think, is the texture going to be the same? And is the aftertaste going to be the same? And is it going to feel the same? Well, there are so many things happening. And I'm very conscious, I think, like all of us are, um, that when you open that Word document and go, I now have to produce something which, you know, someone is telling me what to do, and that's sort of helpful. But that also makes it much more anxiety provoking than me going, you know what, if I mess this up, I mess this up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in fact, Which may I do frequently. that? Frequently. Sure. Um, so there's, there's, I've been translating a novel by Monoranjan Bapari, who is a Dalit writer from Bengal. Now, when I'm reading his text, I can hear his anger. Mm. Although this is a novel, so he's a little more detached than in his autobiography. I can hear his anger not in the, in the meaning of the words, but it, I can hear it. Now the question is, uh, can I be angry in English? Can I be angry in the same way that he is angry? Can I, in my anger, bring out 50 years of tyranny and oppression that he's gone through? I don't know if I can do all those things. On the one hand, if he's a very good writer, then the words will do it for me. But on the other, there's always that notion that maybe I have a certain awareness and cultural understanding of his background, which readers in a different language don't. Yes. And that is actually a greater anxiety than, as you said, mm. having a blank page because you're walking a tightrope. Mm. Uh, a writer can walk a broad road and go anywhere. Right. You can fall off. Right. So, uh, which brings me to the next question. What is most frustrating during the process of translation? Besides the obvious one of stumbling across a tough word. <laughs> uh, b bad writing. Bad, bad writing is so, I, a good, I, difficult writing is great. I love translating things that are difficult. I'm, at the moment, a friend and I are talking to a publisher about a book which we both just read, and there's a moment about three quarters of the way through where suddenly it becomes about palindromes. Palindromes, so phrases that read the same forwards and backwards. And normal people would think, Oh, what a nightmare. You'd never want to translate that. I think a lot of translators look at that and go, oh, that'd be fun. <laughs> that'd be really, really fun. It's that crossword solving thing, right. the crossword puzzle thing that Aronofa was referring to. I think really difficult writing is immensely satisfying. Really bad writing is, it's, it's not only kind of soul destroying, but you wake up in the morning and think, I don't want to spend my day living in this book. Because, you know, as a reader, you may spend eight or 10 hours in a book. As a translator, you will live in this wretched thing for months. Um, and to do that with, with a piece of writing that's bad, not only is it soul-destroying, it's also really difficult. It's really difficult when you're reading something and going, this person doesn't quite know what he means. Or it's not quite, exp I mean, I think I know what, what this writer is saying, but it's so, it's so on the edge of being quite right. It's, it's, I could talk for hours about how annoying it makes <laughs> me, how annoyed it makes me. Um, one of the, the, the benefits, and this, I, I probably shouldn't even say this, but we translate so little into English compared to how much is translated out of English, that for the most part, if you translate into English, you're mostly translating really good books. And I'm immensely lucky that I translate from, it happens to be from these three European languages, but I mostly get to translate books that are really good because the alternative, I mean, Aaron Ava knows I did one book last year which, uh, which is not good. And, um, but as I say, I do this to pay my rent and I, that's how it works. Um, but it's, it's usually so much more difficult, not least getting out of bed in the morning if that's what you're working <laughs> on. Manushri, um, yes, tell us. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, so I, uh, I'm in a position again because I choose what I translate. Okay. And so I have been lucky to not 
have to translate anything that I really dislike. Mm. But one of the things I decided very early on when I began to write is that I wanted to translate also because I wanted to be of use to the Nepali literary community and have their work you know, reach a wider audience. So um, one of the things that really frustrated me was how incredibly male the Nepali literary world was, how um, so-called upper caste it was, and how exclusive the literary circles were. So for me, it's been really frustrating just gathering up Nepali women's work. You have to go knock on doors, make sure you, they, they might not even have copies of their books anymore. They're very easily forgotten or shunted away or you know left out of uh, public events. Um, Dalit writers, other write, writers from other backgrounds, and Nepal has 123 languages. Writing from other languages, which I don't speak, has been very you know, impossible to access. So I realized that um, for me, the frustration has largely been um, realizing that what I thought was uh, you know, the Nepali literary world is actually a very unrepresentative world. It doesn't really include all of Nepal. So, so it's been more uh, political frustrations like that for me. Sure. Talk about yeah. the elephant in the room, the bad <laughs> translation. Right. Now, what happens? We, because I was provoked to ask this because he talked about his good fortune uh, translating from in other languages to English where a good book is available. Now, maybe there's a classic, maybe there's a good book, and there's a bad translation. And you think that you can improve upon that, uh, but you don't either have, I mean, this is a complicated question, because you might not have like his kind of fortunate access to three major languages, but even if you had access to that language and you had a bad translated translation which preceded your own ambitious work on that book, would you be deterred by it? Or would you take it up as a challenge that that translation is so bad that I would do justice to the book? That's one. My uh, problem is that most of the time we are talking of books which are coming out right now and you think you would like others to um, feel, compassionately feel the rage or wrath or whatever it is. But what about books which have been translated before, some very well, some very badly, and most of the books which we have in this country are translated not from Russian directly, Chinese directly, Spanish directly, Portuguese directly, but from retranslations. So what is the challenge of retranslations? And what is the challenge of a bad translation which precedes your book? And simultaneous translations of the same book by competent or not so competent translators at the same point of time. I don't know what is your view. What's frustrating is dialect. Hmm. Because you can hear so many different registers and they signify all kinds of different backgrounds of the speakers. And you're really not able to do justice to that in English. Because if you put them in an artificial, you know, you choose a particular dialect of English, then you're creating an artificial context for them. That doesn't work. If you, if you start using ungrammatical or pidgin English, then you are looking down, you're, you're placing their speech in a certain hierarchy, which is incorrect. Because the person who's speaking in a dialect is speaking in a perfectly consistent grammatical manner in their own dialect. So, and I don't have a solution to this. I don't know if any translator has a solution. I mean, some have tried, and that hasn't come out well either. True, true. Um, in, in all these frustrations and enjoyable experiences, to what extent do you co-create with the authors of the original book? To what extent do they work with you, influence the choice of a word or, or a particular phrase? How do you work together? If you want to know the truth, the best writers to translate are dead writers. <laughs> um, although it helps for them to uh, read your translation afterwards, if they're interested. I was once very famously told by a writer, yeah, I know you've translated my book, but it's not going to be anything as good as the original. So I was very relieved okay. because <laughs> expectations, therefore, were very low. Right. So, <laughs> So yeah, I do, I do, we do refer to them, ask them questions sometimes. But on the whole, I prefer to work on my own and not in collaboration. Understood. <laughs> yes, uh, what about you, Daniel? Um, most of my writers uh, have some English. Uh, some of them have very good English. Um, almost none of them have English as good as they think it is. But often there is a, there is, they have just the right amount of English that they can be extremely helpful without feeling like really they know more than me. 
Um, and I'm quite lucky that I have quite a lot of writers in that sort of position. Almost, with, with the exception of the ones who are, um, as Aaron Ava says, you know, conveniently dead, which is which sort of sidelined them in a useful way. With the exception of those, uh, I will always be in touch with my writer. I will sometimes ask them questions. I will always send them a complete draft of my translation before it goes to the publisher. So they might answer a few questions. They might read it from the beginning to the end and comment on it. They might write and say, I'm sure it's fine, but I'm busy, and isn't this your job? Aren't you meant to be doing this? But there is a moment always towards the end of the process where they, were, where they are, if you like, invited to be involved in the process. Um, and a lot of the translations that I'm proudest of are the ones which I know are very good because there's been a, a lot of detail back and forth between me and the author at the end. The Brazilian book I mentioned earlier is a novel called Resistance, which was published a few months ago. And this is a writer who's, who lives in Brazil, writes in Portuguese, but his English is extremely good. Um, and so he read the draft and he commented, and we, there was quite a lot of back and forth at the end. The moment at which I realized that I was probably bothering him too much, which does occasionally happen, the moment I realized that I'd maybe asked him too many questions was when I sent him, you know, email 7,412, and I asked him a question about exactly what shape the arms of the statue were making. And he wrote back explaining the answer to this question and then saying, I'm glad, by the way, that we're now talking about such small detail because it means that all the important things have been resolved. <laughs> Which I felt was an incredibly gracious way of saying, go away now, <laughs> do your job. Um, but it's, it's, it's an immense pleasure a lot of the time. If you're lucky, as I think I have been with my writers, a lot of the writers I translate are people I've, I'm very good friends with because we've done many books, we've spent a lot of time together, and there's been a lot of back and forth. And I do feel that um, if I can get them uh, involved in the process in a way which is helpful to me as well as helpful to them, that is absolutely ideal. Otherwise, they, they can be dead, as Aaron Ava says. Yes. You permit me to ask one question to Manjushri directly. Sure. What, does, like, uh, what is the portrait of the author as his or her own book translator? If a person, like he's uh, made this relationship between the translator and the author pretty clear. But if you were translating as a work of fiction written by you, as a translator yourself, what would be the split personality disorders? Hmm. Um, you know, so as a translator, I take the same approach as, as Daniel. I want to consult the author as much as the author is willing to be consulted. But I've had my own work translated into several languages which I don't speak blissfully. So if <laughs> Finnish, German, or Japanese, and you know, you get the books, they're translated. I have no idea whether they're good or bad translations, but there they are. Um, I also have had my books, and I'm having one right now, translated into Nepali, which I do read. And the, the expectation of my translator, my Nepali translator, is that I will read it and, and be involved and I just don't want to be involved. I just, as uh, you know, I just want. I trust him. I think he's going to do a good job. I just want him to do his job. So I, I don't, uh, I, I don't know. I, 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 I find it very strange and confusing to be on both sides of, of this. So I'm, I'm going to now request um, uh, you to read. Uh, briefly, uh, we'll conclude with that and then we'll open it up to the audience. So um, I know, uh, Daniel, there is a paragraph that you said that you have memorized. Um, we really want to listen to that because it's, it's wonderful. Um, and Manjushri, is there something in particular you'd like to read? Of course, uh, all the books that uh, the panel uh, has translated are available for sale. Do buy the books. Uh, not all of them are doing this for a living, but please add to their pockets. Thank you. Um, yes, would you like to? Yeah, sure. Is this from your latest okay. yes, so translation? Yes, from uh, Indra Badarai's There's a Carnival Today, which is set in, it was written in 1958 in Darjeeling, uh, just as the two movements that went on to shape Darjeeling. So one is... Um, the rise of the labor union movement and the communist, the Naxalite movement in West Bengal, 
And then the second movement is the rise of a Nepali identity and the Gorkha land identity. So just as those two movements are coming into shape, uh, the novel is, this is like an absolute classic work of Nepali literature, um, even though it's, it's from an Indian author. Uh, it starts off with a panoramic look at the access to Darjeeling uh, through the uh, a sort of description of the landscape. So I'll just read the first passage. Gleaming black from the rains, the cart road knocks against many cliffs, bluffs, and sloping hills, joining Lebong, that flat patch of land in the north, to dusty, clangorous Silgari Bazar. Cart road, this artery that makes life flow through the mountain districts. Landslides tug at it for four months in the monsoon. Its mud top tumbles and it's buried. Ancient sal trees lay their bodies across the road in an act of civil disobedience. The mountain dwellers then set out to fulfill their duty, securing the walls, clearing the soil, hacking off the male pride of the trees. Countless ox carts, train trolleys, jeeps, buses, cars, and trucks are this road's daily passengers. A train vanishes at each turn in the forested density of Sukuna, playing hide-and-seek like an unsightly lover with the jeep. The jeep leaves it behind and speeds on though it, as though it were the truth of the world. When, trailing behind at a fabled pace and pausing, the train climbs up the Bastasi hill and can't see him, she emits a deep, smoky exhalation, shrieks, soaks the ground with hot tears. It must be masculine pity that compels the jeep, which, like a bumblebee, goes anywhere, to love the train, a woman who must follow a fixed route. When at some point the two are able to meet, as in the aligning of two planets, a truck transporting loads of coal, potatoes, tin, and cigarettes views them with a split personality, one eye blazing red with desire, the other soulless with fear. The novel goes on to sort of zoom into uh, the life of a family in Darjeeling, and uh, basically the protagonist, Janak, is very much caught up in all of the social movements that are going on. He's a real community builder, and it is a beautiful portrait of a community, sort of post-independence Darjeeling, um, uh, again, as these movements that still today uh, are unresolved, um, are just on the rise. Thank you. Yes, Arunavas. Thank you. Um, this is a short... All right, a short passage from um, uh, this book titled There's Gunpowder in the Air. This is set in a jail. Um, here in Bengal, the cat is referred to as the tiger's aunt. Whether it applies to other cats or not, the name is eminently applicable to Halum the cat. He's as fat as he's tall. He has been living in the jail for about three years. Halum strolls in silence along the path between two wards to arrive at the case table. The store's godown is next to Hamdani near the gate. Three huge locks hang on its door. All the thieves and robbers are locked in the wards. Those who roam around free are not thieves, but guards. Whom has the godown been secured from? Halum isn't bothered about any of this. He goes directly to Amdani and looks around with eyes glowing like marbles. A 60-watt bulb is hanging inside. Its light has created a ghostly atmosphere in the corners of the room. You can also see there isn't an inch of space inside. Amdani is chock-a-block with people. Good heavens, so many people sent to jail these days. Why? Don't they have any other place to go? Never mind all that. The question is how to get in. At least eight people are sprawled directly in front of the door. But still there's a way. There's some space beneath the only window. If only he can jump on the sill, slip through the bars and leap, he can vault over Jaladhar, who is in charge at Amdani tonight, and land near the pitcher of water. If there's any food, that's where it will be. Even if nothing particularly delicious is available, there should at least be some fish bones. There was fish for dinner tonight. No matter how often a prisoner has been to jail, he can never sleep the first few nights. The ghastly memories of the road to jail pursue him all the time. He cannot rest for anxiety about the future. All that he can achieve in this state can at best be called dozing. A large number of people are dozing on the floor of Amdani right now. Halum jumps gently on the, onto the windowsill and pokes his head in through the doors, calculating the distance he makes his leap. But his calculations have gone awry. Instead of covering the distance he meant to, he lands squarely on Jaladhar's chest. The sudden impact of a heavy object breaks Jaladhar's light sleep. Ah, he screams. Everyone wakes up at his anguished cry. Those of them who have been to this jail before and know of Bandiswala open their sleepless eyes to find Bandiswala. 
He may have shrunk his body, but he has made no attempt to hide his white bandages and his blazing eyes. He is attacking Jaladhar with all his fury. In panic, they add their screams to Jaladhar's. Ah, 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 ah. Hearing them, the remaining prisoners start screaming in unison without having the slightest idea of what's going on. Ah, 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 ah. Halum was not expecting this. He is disconcerted by this thunderstorm of wails. Cancelling his plans, he leaps back through the window and disappears through the bars. Thank you. Yes, um, Daniel. I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I have two new books with me, but the readings from those are quite long, so I'm going to do something much shorter from something quite a long time ago, which is a book by uh, an Angolan writer called Zeduato Agualuza, with whom I've been writing, uh, working for a long time. Um, and it's a book called My Father's Wives. And it's my favorite thing to read from anything I've worked on, I think, because it's just a paragraph and it's, it has a number of qualities. One is that it's the kind of thing that I don't think an English language writer would ever write, which is always interesting for me in terms of why I do this strange job at all. And also, it's an incredibly complex, very, very unlikely single metaphor built into one, uh, one paragraph. Um, very briefly, background, the narrator is driving through the southern African desert. He stops in a cafe to, to get a drink halfway in the middle of the night, and he starts a conversation with the man behind the bar. And it becomes clear in this conversation that the man behind the bar is the person who killed his, the narrator's, father during the Civil War. There's this kind of moment of terrible realization, and the narrator goes outside and sits on the floor just to kind of clear his head. The man from the bar has also worked this out, and he comes out to, we don't know, to apologize, to say something to him. And the, the man behind the bar, he holds his hand out to the narrator. And it goes, I took his hand, a broad, bony hand, a little calloused, I noticed his face properly now. He had light eyes, clean and sincere, with little wrinkles at the corners, deep bags under his eyes. He reminded me of an old turtle from my childhood. He went by the name of Leonardo because he really liked listening to Leonard Cohen. Sometimes he would disappear for weeks, but to bring him back, all you had to do was put on a record by the Canadian singer. And at the first lines of famous blue raincoat, it's four in the morning, the end of December, I'm writing you now just to see if you're better, Leonardo would emerge from some unknown abyss somewhere, still dragging behind him the torpor of a long sleep. He'd get up onto his back legs next to one of the columns, he'd stretch out his neck, and for a few moments, seemed to be completely happy. Then he would go back to being sad again, a sadness like the sadness of the deserts. The man in front of me now, he looked like Leonardo looked, the turtle, when the music came to an end. Thank you. Pish -pish, I'm, I'm not sure if you have anything to read from. Okay. So um, let's take some questions. Uh, yes, could we have a mic for this gentleman in the front? Thank you. No, this side, the, the second row, yeah. Hi, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, um, I have two short questions. Uh, the first was, um, in the process of translation, do you actually start from beginning to the end or are there more complicated trajectories to take? My second question is, uh, it's often said that a work of, like a, like a book is a, a product of its time. Is the translation, is the, is the responsibility to be a product of the book's time or somewhere in the middle, meeting where the audience is? Thank you. Thanks. Who'd like to, Arunava? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Um, in terms of the trajectory, everyone works differently. I more or less work the same way with every book I do, which is I start at the beginning and go through to the end. But I also, the way I tend to work is, if possible, I try not to have read the book before I start. So I start at the, on the first page with absolutely no idea what's coming. Um, and I will then work through, I'll do a first draft, which is very quick, which is basically motivated by wanting to know what happens when I turn the page. Um, then you get to the end, and then you spend the rest of your life just kind of trying to make it good. 
um, but certainly I start from the beginning with as little knowledge as possible and race through to the, to the end of it. Um, the, the second question is a really interesting one. It depends, I think, partly on the kind of book you're doing. I think it depends if, as Bushmesh was saying, if you're translating a classic, you're translating something for, for the second, third, fifth time, um, your responsibility to your audience to produce today's Don Quixote, which is different from yesterday's Don Quixote, or tomorrow's Don Quixote, I think it's a different proposition. Mostly if you're translating a book that is by a contemporary writer, um, this is the only translation they're going to get. It won't be translated you know, again and again and again and again, so I think it's slightly different. It also depends, I think, to some extent on the genre, and I know, for example, there's a theater translator called uh, Neil Bartlett who says what he wants to do is produce a translation of this play for this audience tonight, tomorrow we'll figure out something else. But it's very much about connecting to the audience today. The other thing is also worth saying that you can try to produce a translation for the ages, but I don't think it's possible. I think a translation will always be of its moment because if I were to translate Don Quixote, I translate it with the resources of somebody who is a white man in the south of England in 2019. I mean, I, th I only have what I've got now to work with. And so I think you may want to do something which is timeless, but I don't think that is really possible. The lady at the back, please. Hi. Uh, my question is generally to everyone, but might be in particular to Manjusha Thapa. Uh, the question basically is, as a translator, and you are a writer as well, do we take it for granted the premise that content is the king? And hence, whether you say the flower is red, or the red flower, the effect is going to be same. Or uh, I can kind of to give you the context wh where I'm coming from. Uh, the only work of Murakami that we read are in English, because obviously I, can't, I don't uh, read Japanese. But it's so good, and then you think that is it, because that is what the author meant or was trying to say. Uh, you're happy with it, but sometimes I wonder how much is it the translator's job uh, to ensure there is nothing lost in translation. I, you know, I think uh, as a translator, you begin with the premise that you are going to lose things in translation. So the question becomes, which mistakes are unforgivable? And which mistakes, or, or how do you prioritize? If you have to uh, prioritize you know, the rhythm, the sound, the word choice, the diction, uh, you know, the, the mood, atmosphere, tone, uh, if you're going to fit all of that in, what is the important thing? So I, for me, you know, not translating the content is unforgivable. So that has to go over. But then after that, it becomes this wonderful uh, uh, choice of, of your own aesthetics and ethics as a translator to figure out what is the important uh, intent of the author there. Was tone more important? Or you know, if it's very high diction, uh, do you stay with the high diction? Or it's, it's very colloquial, you go colloquial. And so you really have to um, kind of respect the, the author's intention there, which is my solution to it. But I think there may be other solutions. Right. Um, one question from the second row, if we could get the mic there. I think we have time for just one question. Uh, so when you translate a book from one language to another, you can't translate everything. Uh, I mean, some of the things uh, may be uh, culturally inappropriate, or maybe they don't even make sense in that language. Uh, for example, in the Harry Potter books, in the uh, Spanish translations, they change the name of the houses, which is a very key, uh, key, key part of the original books. So how, uh, how do you know when to draw the line? Uh, when you need to stop, when you uh, need to hold the essence of the book? I don't know. Well, all I'll say is that I'd like a translation to be read as though it's not been written in your backyard. It, it's a product of a different culture. It's a product of a different geography, perhaps even a different history. And I see no need to normalize that entirely to the context of the reader. So I think, I think the distance needs to be maintained. It's also about the, the, this question of having to decide which of the things you think are the most important. And sometimes, if you're translating, if you're translating a Harry Potter book, you may think, well, actually keeping Gryffindor as Gryffindor is really important because everyone in the world knows it's Gryffindor. Or you may think, well, Gryffindor, it has that word Gryffin in it. And maybe the important thing is to translate that name and keep 
as they did with, with Dumbledore. Dumbledore has lots of different names because Dumbledore actually has a particular meaning. It actually means something. It's not just a name. And so you think about what are the things that you want to keep. Sometimes that means you change things in order to keep something else. But you also think about what are the things that your language allows you to do. Everything that is in the Harry Potter books is there because J.K. Rowling knows that English allows her to do diagonally. Diagonally is a pun which only works in English because diagon and diagon and it's an alley and it's di right. On the other hand, if you're translating into French, maybe you can't do that. But French allows you to do completely different things. The French word for a sorting hat is much, much funnier and much cleverer than the English because French happens to allow that. And so the translator of the Harry Potter books into French will have thought, well, I can't make an equivalent of diagonally, so I'll call it whatever. On the other hand, Aha, I have a good idea that I can do this other thing with the sorting hat, and you kind of compensate. But it's about deciding what are the things you think are important. It may be that you think they have to be called muggles absolutely everywhere, or maybe you think, well, I'm going to find something which in my language gives that sense of something a little bit dull and a little bit plodding and a little bit kind of you know, heavy and non-magical. And so you create something which has the same effect, which is a different word, but has the effect on a French reader that muggle, which is a horrible word, has on an English reader. Thank you. I'm sorry we're out of time. Uh, but thank you. You can always catch up with the uh, translators after the session. Thank you very much.